Well, let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we'll get started. Father, thank you for this incredible book of Ephesians. Thank you for the opportunity to dive in and, and develop our skills at studying it for ourselves. And we need your help, Lord. We know this is a spiritual book, and the insights, they're, they're not just learned through skill. Your Holy Spirit has to open our eyes and open our hearts, and so we pray you do that work in our midst today, that as we put in our work and we do our part, that you would do your part and bring us great insight that would change our lives. We trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, just to kind of uh, get you back familiar, does anybody need a, uh, how do you guys feel with the inductive Bible study method? Anybody need a review on that? Or do you want to just jump right into the, the text? Text. text? text? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Don't let the text people bully you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're just going to jump into the text then. We're in uh, chapter 2. So Ephesians is one of those rare books that the chapter breaks also correspond with the segment breaks. Um, so you actually just get to be in chapter 2. That's going to be uh, the unit that we study next. So there's four paragraphs there. And what do you remember about inductive Bible study? What's the first step of inductive Bible study? Make observations, right? And what are we going to go look for in chapter 2 if you haven't done it yet? What's the first thing we want to look for? Re repetitions, yeah. Re words that repeat, phrases, similar phrases that repeat. Then what do we want to look for? We, and how would we find contrast, comparisons, substantiations, causations? Flag words, right? We want to look for our flag words. So it's just like looking for repetitions, but instead of looking for words that repeat, we're looking for specific words. What are the specific words we're looking for? But, yet, nevertheless, that's a contrast. What about a causation? Therefore, so, then, all right. What about a substantiation, an idea that's supporting the idea that came in front of it? Because, for, those will be our big ones for that. What about a comparison? What are some of our, what flag words do we want to look for to see a comparison? Like, as, in a similar way, right? These are things that are going to tell us that it's a comparison. So why don't you take a minute and at your tables, uh, look at, start looking at that first paragraph in chapter two. It's a long paragraph. Um, one thing I want to make note of, let me jump over to that. One thing I want to make note of here is... Right here, oops, I didn't want that, I want, if you look here, um, this part where it says, and you he made alive, on yours, it should be in italics, does everybody see that? So that's not in the, in the text, the, uh, the translators put it there because they don't want you to feel bad. Okay, but it's actually not in the text. So I want you to cross out he made alive because it's not there. Right? It just Paul just says you were dead. Translators think that's kind of harsh, so they added this part, which we're going to pick up in verse 4. And so I just want you just to cross that out so it doesn't confuse you uh, about what's going on. Okay, so go ahead. And at your tables, go ahead and, and make some observations and then talk about what you're seeing as you're doing it. Okay, what are you seeing as you make those observations? I'll give you five minutes.
New King James. Nope, that's there. Uh, why was it a because in the Greek, it's it comes across as a parenthetical thought, and so there's no like Greek doesn't have commas, periods, exclamation points, and so the translators put in English punctuation to try to communicate what's happening in the Greek. All right, how's everybody doing? Need a little more time? You got it. One in.
let's talk about what you saw. Shout it out. What did you guys see? I know you saw some stuff. It's like, okay. Yep, everybody see that, right? The butt right there in verse 4. So I'm going to put a little C letting me know that I've got a contrast right there. Okay. Well, remember, we're, not, we're just making observations. We haven't asked any questions, so we can't make any answers yet. So remember, this is the discipline of inductive. Make your observations first. See everything that's there to see. And then we'll go and make our, our, then we'll start asking our questions and try to find our answers. What else did you see? The, the, that right here, that in the ages to come, that one, is that the one you're talking about? Yep, yep, so that's a, a little, nope, sorry, wrong one. That's a little causation, so it's not starting a sentence or starting a paragraph, so it's not, it's not controlling the paragraph at all, but we'll definitely get to that when we ask our questions. Yeah, did everybody see the four in verse eight? For by grace you've been saved. What is that? Substantiation. It supports, it substantiates the idea before that. And that's a big one, so I'm going to color that one in so it lets me know the difference. Uh, love definitely would be a repetition that we'd see here. Uh, but love and grace, those are kind of different concepts. Come on in. Um, so we've got one more big structure happening. Did anybody see it? One more substantiation. Ten, yeah. For we are his workmanship. All right, so you got those two big substantiations pointing back up into the text. Okay. All right, let's talk some repetitions. What, what words did you see repeated? Right, so we've got, a, we've got some, we've got Christ, right? So we've got Christ in verse 5. We've got it in verse 6. We've got it in verse 7 and verse 10. And what do you know about, what do you see about that repetition? There's something that goes with it. Right, so with so there's always a there's a preposition with it, right? With Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It's this idea that's carrying over from chapter one. Remember, where the whole focus was about being in Him. That idea, Paul's carrying that idea into segment two, and so we want to make note of that, and we can bring all the richness of all the stuff we saw in chapter one into chapter 2 with us, okay? What else did you see? Yeah, we had a couple grace, right? All right, so we've got uh, by grace. All right, by grace you've been saved. We get that phrase twice. And it is grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Right? Everybody see those? Yeah. What else did you see? Anything else? Okay. Works, right? So we've got works in 10. Where else do we have works? So sort of works here, but it's it's a different 
idea, right, of God working versus the idea of our works. It's kind of a different idea, but we'll, I'll underline it. And then verse 9, right? Okay. What else did you see? Love. We, said, we had talked about that. We had love. Right. In verse 4, he loved us. Great love with which he loved us. And uh, I think there was one. Is there one more? Or is that it? I think that's it. And then uh, what was the other question? Yeah, we have dead. Go ahead and do that one in red. Dead and dead in verse 5. Okay, that's good, right? You've seen a lot of stuff coming in, Charlotte. Uh, we're going to, we'll continue. So your homework will be to continue through the other three paragraphs uh, and kind of follow some of those ideas, keep following those ideas and see which of those repetitions continue for the whole segment? Um, there's, a, there's one more I want you to see because it's going to be important in the whole segment, and that's flesh. Okay, so in verse 3, we've got flesh twice. It's not a real big idea in this paragraph per se, but we're going to see it in the... In, keep repeating in the following paragraph. So it's an idea that Paul is going to keep repeating here. All right. So let you ready to, what's our second step in inductive Bible study? Ask questions. All right. So what would you, what questions do you want to start with? Factual questions. Okay. What, what, part of our repetitions do you want to start with? No preference? What? Yeah, we could ask the most repeated. It's kind of a, a hodgepodge, right? Not a, a real strong sense of repetition like we had in the first segment where we had some really dominant ones, what I, I would suggest is let's start with the contrast because it's the biggest thing happening in the, in the paragraph. So what's the factual question that we want to ask about a contrast? What two things are being contrasted, right? So that's a simple question. What's the answer? This takes a little bit of weeding clauses out because, you know, Paul likes to load up his sentences with a lot of different clauses. Excellent, right? So you who were dead in trespasses and sins, right, and then in which you once walked, that's modifying being dead in our trespasses and sins. So we know that the rest of the material is modifying, but what's the contrast? Made us alive together with Christ. Right? So that's our contrast. On one side, on our own, what were we? Dead in our trespasses and sins, but... What did God do? He made us alive in Christ. Okay, so that's the contrast. Now, what questions do we want to ask about the contrast that we see here now? We'll get to the, the let's ask a couple more factual questions because I think there's a little bit yeah, what does he mean that we were dead, right? That we'd want to ask that question. What does he mean by dead? In what way were we dead? Were we physically dead? 
How do we know? Okay, the Greek... Oh, that's not good for it. Yeah, so, so we were dead, and that word means without life, right? Without life, without animation, without power, uh, separated from uh, a life force. Another way to think about it is powerless, right? So this death, when you're dead, what can you do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. What were we dead in? Trespasses and sins. So what question can we ask about that? Yeah, what does the word trespass mean? Right? Because what, what does it mean in our context, in our culture? Where have you ever seen that word before outside of church? No trespassing, right? Uh, is that what Paul means? That we were, we somehow got onto somebody else's property and that killed us. Is that what he means? Don't think so. So what does the word trespass mean? <laughs> it's a deviation from the truth. Yep. What else? What's the difference between a trespass and a sin? Okay, so the word trespass means to... Think of it as purposefully crossing a line. When you trespass, you are doing something purposefully that you know is wrong. What does the word sin mean? Yeah, to miss the mark or to fall short of a standard. Okay, so what does it mean to be dead in trespasses and sins? It, well, it's kind of a, it covers all of it, right? It covers all of your behavior. Some stuff you do knowing it's wrong, and some stuff you are trying to do what's right, but you just don't measure up, right? So what is not part of the equation here. What, what type of wrongdoing is not included here? It's kind of a trick question. It covers all of it. That's the, right? It, there's, no, there's no excuses it covers all of it. Uh, every sin, every trespass, what does it result in? Death. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more. Let's go a little bit deeper into this because now we've got some modifying phrases here. What do we know about being dead? What did we do when we were dead? Yeah, we walked according to something. So we were powerless. We were separated from the life of God because of our trespasses and sins. And so what did we do? What, what does the word walked mean? What does this word mean, walked?
Yeah, it, it has to do with the way we navigate life, right? It's the way we move through life. That's what the word walk means. It's your habitual behavior. It's the way you act. It's the way you talk. It's the way you respond. It's the choices you make. It's your lifestyle. So Paul says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and as a result, we walked according to what? Okay, interesting phrase, the course of this world. What does that mean? Okay, so, let's, let's, so course is the, the Greek word aeon, and it means the, the dynamic force of something. So what are we in our trespasses and sins? Dead, powerless, but what are we living in? What are we walking according to or in the midst of? And what, uh, uh, what, what's the course of this world mean? A dynamic force. So what are we? We're dead and powerless, but what are we in the middle of? A dynamic force. This world has a force to it. Right? Anyone ever been to a river? Anyone ever swam in a river? All right. What happens when you're in the river if you don't do anything? Right? So if you were a dead fish in a river, what direction would you go? Wherever the course of the river is taking you. This is the idea that Paul is communicating. When we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we're like a dead fish in a river that has its own force. And it takes us in a direction. So the world has a dynamic force to it that is moving in a direction. Make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. All right. And so we are walking according to this dynamic force in the world. What's the dynamic force of this world being directed by? What's it according to? Prince of the power of the air. Who, what is that a reference to? Who's the prince of the power of the air? All right. How do we know that? How do we know that's not Gabriel? How do we know that's not angels? Because we got a little more clarification, right? What does that spirit do? All right. So we know it's got, a, so we get a clarification. This isn't a, an angel that's not a, it's not Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. This is a demonic power that's working in the sons of disobedience. Who's the prince of that demonic realm? Satan is. That's how we make this. You see how we come to this conclusion that, this, that we're talking about Satan here. So now I want you to think about this. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, but what are we living in? The dynamic force of this world. We, what do we call it? What's our, our word for this? Culture. Right? The course of this world is the culture. It has a force to it that is moving people who are dead in a direction. Who sets the direction of our culture? The prince of the power of the air. What does this change? Does this change your perspective on culture? So think about this. What's the culture? What's the agenda of the prince of the power of the air? What does he want to work? What's he work? What does it say? Does it say against God? God. 
I heard someone say it. Disobedience. You see that? The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So think about this. On our own, we were dead, lifeless, powerless in our trespasses and sins, and we're living in a culture that has a dynamic force to it that is directed by the devil with the sole purpose of getting us to do what? Disobey. Okay, so this is the first half of the, well, and we're almost, almost to the first half of our con contrast. Okay, so this is who we are. So we're in a culture that's being directed by the devil that's designed to get us to live in disobedience. That's the culture that we live in. It always has a dynamic force. It's always directed by the devil, and it's always causing us to live in disobedience. Now, just a little sidebar here, because this gets to be a hot topic uh, a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times the church mistakenly thinks that it can set the course of the world. But what do we know from this text? Who sets the course of the world? The devil does, not the church. That makes sense? So just log that in your brain. Sometimes we get sucked into battles that aren't biblical. We have a different battle, uh, but it's not to shape the culture. Okay? Just be clear on that, all right? Because we know that the devil is the one who directs the dynamic force of the culture that we live in. Okay? Yes? All right. Now, verse 3, what does it tell us about us in this context? What, uh, what new information do we get about ourselves? Yeah, so there's this word also here, right? Among whom also, what's that pointing back to? Who's the also? The sons of disobedience. So we were also sons of disobedience in the way we did what? Conducted ourselves. How, in what did we conduct ourselves? All right, so it's in the lust of our flesh. So think about this. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we were powerless, cut off from the life of God. But what were we living in? The dynamic force of the culture that's being directed by Satan... And he that works what in us? Disobedience. We were also living in that disobedience. And what was another factor that pushed us in that direction? The lust of our flesh. So what does the culture tap into? The lust of our flesh. You see how bad things are? All right, so Paul's just really hammering this. We're not only living in a dynamic, uh, forceful culture that's working disobedience at the direction of the devil, but it's tapping into the lusts of my own flesh. All right. And what am I, the, the ING participle, anybody remember what that is, where we have fulfilling here? When we have an ING participle, what does that do? Yeah, so it's a gerund, a verb participle that is modifying the previous verb or the main verb in the sentence. So we were conducting ourselves in order that we might fulfill, right? So fulfilling points back to how we conducted ourselves, all right? So why were we living the way we were living in the lusts of our flesh? What were we trying to fulfill The desires of what? 
our flesh and what? Our mind. What's significant about that? And this is something a lot of people miss when they think about being dead in trespasses and sins. Anybody ever like see people like, well, I'm a good person, right? I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a philanderer. I'm not a thief. I'm not a liar. Those are, so the flesh has, the desires of the flesh speak to what? Yeah, so to physical pleasure, the things that feel good physically, right? Sex, alcohol, drugs, um, violence. Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, give our, our, us a sense of physical pleasure. What are the desires of the mind? Pride, right? To be better than. What else? What else does the mind desire? Superiority, control. Right? These are the things that the mind desires. A lot of times we look at, we tend to put people who are living more for the flesh in a worse category than people who are living for the desires of their mind. And I think academia is full of people who are living in disobedience in their minds, right? They're purposefully pushing back against the truth of God in a form of intellectual disobedience. And so you got to see the whole picture that Paul's putting up here. There is a part of our culture that, yes, appeals to the flesh, but there is also a part of our culture that appeals to the sinful mind with ideologies and, and frameworks that make us feel like we don't need God or we're superior to others. All the isms that are out there are the desires of the mind, right? Racism is a function of the mind. You know, um, chauvinism is a function of the mind. Uh, all those prejudices that, that are such an issue in our culture, they are part of Satan's purpose to get us living in disobedience. This makes sense? All right. So let's finish off this, this first half of the contrast. What does that make us? By nature, children of wrath. What does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's who we are, right? We didn't have to earn it. It's just our nature is to live a way that puts us as objects of God's wrath. All right, so all of this disobedience. So think about what is the devil's ultimate game plan? This might be something that surprises you. Yeah, the devil actually wants to leverage God's holiness to bring wrath upon God's people. That's his end game. He knows he can't destroy us, but if we rebel against God, we'll make ourselves, we make ourselves objects of wrath. And so all the devil has to get us to do is to live in this culture uh, that is working disobedience in us and proving that we are children of wrath. Does this make sense? Yeah? Any questions? No? Everybody got it or you like, don't? nobody has it? 
Got it? Make sense? Any questions? Okay, you sure? Okay, so at your tables, I want you to come up with a seven-word summary of the first half of the contrast. It can't be longer than seven words. Seven words. So take all of that, and I'm going to call on your table, so you need a spokesman too. not a mistake so it's uh the translators added it because it's not Okay, one more minute. You everybody got their seven words? <laughs> try to try to have it be cohesive. All right, what do you guys have? 
All right, we're going to start with the back corner table because you got the most experienced people back there. What do you guys got? Who's your spokesperson? Is it David or Jesse? What do you got so far? Okay, we were dead under Satan, under wrath. Okay. It's pretty good. I like that. You got the major concepts. How about you guys? Do you guys come up with one? It sounds like like 12 words. <laughs> it's good, though. It's good. It's good. I like it. Say that again. You had some good phraseology in there. Okay, so you probably ca chop off that last phrase, and you'd be close. All right, what would you guys come up with? That was good, though. By our nature, we are dead. Our nature, we're dead. Good, good, I like that. You got the nature part in there. So you guys just went straight biblical. <laughs> no creativity, innovation. <laughs> That, that works, but we'll take it. We'll take it. And remember, there's no right or wrong answer here. The, the, what you're doing is one of the most important parts of Bible study, and that's rephrasing it in words that make sense to you. Because once you've done that, that means you can communicate it to someone else. Until you can do that, you can't share it. Okay? All right. What do you guys have? Paul, you the spokesperson? You put your glasses on. That's usually what it means. I put my glasses on like I'm reading. <laughs> Pick one. I like that. That's, that's pretty good. Dead fish in a cultural river. All right. That's good. All right, the one I wrote down uh, just now was dead and devil-driven descendants of wrath. All right. What? Yeah, I want all Ds. Dead, devil-driven descendants of wrath. It's actually six. I got a free word in that I didn't use. Dead, devil-driven descendants of wrath. I was trying to come up with a word for D. I was going to say damnation, but then I would have been all Ds. But I thought you guys might not like the word damnation. <laughs> all right, so that's the first half of our contrast, right? That's the first half of our contrast, that we're, we're dead. That's the big idea. We're dead, but we want to carry this idea that it's worse than being dead. That being dead means that we're driven by the devil to do disobedient. I should, I could, I should put disobedient in to be my seventh word. All right? Uh, disobedient descendants of damnation. All right? All right? So we want to carry this thought. What's the second half of the contrast now? So that's the first half. We were dead. In our trespasses and sins, pushed by the culture that's causing us to live in disobedience, making us objects of God's wrath. That's what we were, but what? Okay, but God, good. But God what? What did God do? Okay, so he made us alive with whom? With Christ. So here's this important idea again that our life is intrinsically tied to whom? Jesus, right? So this is critical that you got to think about this that our life used to be driven by what? The devil's culture. That was the dynamic force in our life. What's the dynamic force now? Jesus, he is the dynamic life force that is, 
that is different than the force of the culture. This is why it's so important that when you get saved, you start to feel tension with the culture. If you feel no tension with the culture, what does that probably mean? You're probably not alive, right? Or if you are, for some reason, you're swimming with the flow. Hey, we want to be salmon. We want to go upstream for the long haul, right? So he made us alive together with Christ. Now, what is it about God that caused him to make us alive? That's the next set of questions we want to look at. Run the question by me one more time. I didn't catch the phone. Well, let's, let's just look and see what the text says. So let's see if that comes up, right? So we don't need to force anything. Let's just see if, if there's something there uh, for us. So let's look at the words that are there. What do we know about God? What does he tell us? What does Paul tell us about God in verse 5? Or verse 4, sorry. He's rich, right? What does rich mean? has an abundance, more than he needs, right? So he's rich in what? Mercy. What's the internal substantiation here? Why is he rich in mercy? Right? His great love with which he loved us is what fuels God's mercy. You ever think about that? You ever know that about mercy? That mercy has at the heart of it love. Right? So it's because of his great love, not casual love, not little love, but it's this great love. Anybody look up the word love there? Any guesses on which one it is there? <laughs> yeah, she knows. <laughs> huh. Right? Yeah, so it's agape, right? It's this unconditional, unmerited love that God has for us. So it's he loved us with great agape. When did God love us with great agape in verse 5? Even when we were dead. What were we when we were dead? grab the whole thought. Remember, we spent a lot of time going over this. We were dead in our trespasses. What were we doing? We were going with, we were following the devil, doing what? Living in disobedience because we wanted to fulfill what? The lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our mind and our body. Right? Just side note here. What's the worst metric or rubric for decision-making as a Christian? Your desires, right? I really want you just to grab a hold of that. Never tell someone, what does your heart tell you, right? Uh, do, what, you know, make a list of what do, you, what do you really want out of life. That's the devil's mantra. That's his playbook. That's him trying to tap into the flesh and the selfishness, right? If I was going on this whole, totally new paradigm, what would I be asking? What does Jesus want? Because that's where I am now. I'm in him, right? The, the WWJD really does have some merit to it, right? To be asking, what would Jesus do? So back here, so even when we were dead, so all of that now tells me, goes back to this idea that I'm powerless, being driven by a satanic culture 
to live in disobedience, which taps into my sinful, selfish desires that causes me to be a child of God's wrath. So even when I was a, an object of wrath, what did God do? He loved you with what? Great love. Think about this. How messed up were you? And what did God do when you were at your worst? He loved you the most. He didn't love you with just enough love to get you saved. He loved you with great, lavish, abundant love. Because he is rich in mercy. All right, now think about this, right? Sin creates debt. How much mercy does God have? All right, I love this thought that God is a bigger lover than you are a sinner. God has more mercy than you have disobedience. He is rich in all of these things. Now, we're going to learn that this is not an excuse to go sin more. I just want to throw that out as a caveat. All right. But whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, what can you be assured of? God's love is greater. God's mercy is richer. All right? So in that, God made us alive. And then we get this parenthetical statement that he'll repeat again in verse 8. By grace, you've been saved. What's grace mean? So mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. Grace is getting the favor that you do not deserve. All right. Now, anybody ever get pulled over for speeding? All right. All right. Anybody ever been let off? I have not. <laughs> All right, I've been pulled over twice in my life for speeding. I got tickets both times. Uh, once when I was 16, uh, and once when I was in Finland. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they make you pay on the spot <laughs> in Finland. They don't have no uh, court date, no nothing. You pay that guy on the spot. All right, so those of you that got pulled over, were you guilty? Yes, and because you get lo got let off, what did you receive? Mercy. You received mercy. You did not get the ticket you deserved. How many of you received grace? What would it be like to receive grace? Yeah, he gives you 100 bucks for gas. That's grace. You see the difference? Right? So mercy is not getting the punishment we deserve. Grace is actually loading you with favor that you don't deserve. Okay? So we're saved by what? By this favor. Right? So salvation isn't just about being forgiven. Forgiven is about mercy. Salvation is about something greater than forgiveness. Okay, so just log that in there. We're going to keep following this thought. What did he do in making us alive? Look at verse 6. What else did he do? So he made us alive, and then what did he do? 
raised us up. And here's that word again, together. So what does that point us to? Together with whom? Back to with Christ. So just like we were made alive with Christ, we shared in Christ's life, we are being raised with Christ. So there's an elevation that we share with Jesus. This is going to be a big, profound thought that Paul is going to develop, but it, it gets introduced here. So I want you to, to log this, note this, put a star in the margin, because this is a big deal. And this is something that a lot of Christians never learn to embrace. They stay in mercy, and they never step into grace. They stay alive, I'm alive, I'm going to make it to heaven, but they never live an elevated life. Okay, and this is what is going to be life-changing about this segment. Anybody ever wanted to live an elevated life? This is what, he's, God, what Paul is saying God did. He didn't just make you alive. He raised you. He elevated you with Christ. And not only did he elevate you, what else did he do? Oops. Oh, I lost all my... Can you, can you come back? Come back. Oh, too far. Hang on a second. All right, I lost all my notes, but it's okay, it's clean again. All right, so, so let's go back here, right? So he made us alive together with Christ. It's okay, we love that sound. That's the sound of the future, okay? Just st stay put, because you're the one that does the most homework, right? And made us sit together, right? So he raised us up and together and made us sit where? Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, think about it. So it's not... So it's not that we're going to heaven, right? All of this is connected to whom? To Jesus. So the, li so the life we have, whose life is it? Jesus is. The raised, elevated, experienced position we have, whose is it? It's Jesus's. The sitting in heaven, who's it connected with? What does it mean for Jesus to sit in heaven? It's not, it's, not, it's not eschatology. This is, this is all stuff that Paul is saying is now, right? You're alive, you're raised, you're seated with Christ. This isn't eschatology. This isn't stuff to come. This is your life right now. This is your reality. Where are you? Okay, so think about this. 
This should rocket, those who are here for segment one, this should rocket you back to segment one. Remember, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And now... And they're, they're in Christ, in heavenly places. What do we have here? We're together with Jesus in heavenly places. Okay, so think about the contrast, right? What were we walking according to? The course of this world. What are we now on the other side of the equation? Seated, we're not walking, we're seated where? Heavenly places. So think about this. When I was dead, what was my paradigm? I'm just being sucked along in the culture of this world. What's my new paradigm in Christ? Yeah, I'm so. Yeah, I'm not being driven, I'm not being sucked along, I'm resting, I'm seated in heavenly places, secure with Christ. How should that shift, what's the significance of that? How should that shift our framework, our thinking about life now? He's in control. Security. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yes, a little bit. No. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Yes. And now, what's the what's the causation here? What's the little causation? No, the that in verse 7. What's, remember, what was the devil's end game? Yeah, use God's holiness against us and destroy us in God's wrath. Get us to be destroyed by God's wrath. What's God's end game? Yeah, what are the ages to come? What does that mean? Yeah, what are the ages to come? Yeah, it's a reference to beyond this age. It's time beyond this age, eternity. What does God want to do for eternity? What's God going to do for eternity? He's going to show us something, reveal something to us. What is it? The exceeding. What does exceeding mean? Yeah, it's way over the top, right? It's to, the word means to throw beyond, right? To go be, way beyond. So God, we know that God was rich in mercy. What's he also rich in? Riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So think about God puts us in Jesus so he can do what? What does he want to show us? Yeah, how excessive his grace. And what's grace? Yeah, getting good that you don't deserve. So how much good does God want to give you in eternity? Excessive amount of goodness that you don't deserve, didn't earn. Um, I know that there's a, a passage, that we're not going to get into it because it's in Corinthians, but it's, it's shaped a lot of Christian thinking 
uh, around our works-based culture that you and I are working for heavenly rewards. Anybody ever right, heard that idea? Hey, you got to do, got to, you know, rack up your rewards in heaven as if our effort could produce more goodness than God's excessive grace. All right, so there's a disconnect here. The real riches of eternity is not tied to my effort, but it's tied to God's excessive grace. How long is God going to give us an excess of goodness, more than can actually be experienced and absorbed? What does that tell you about God and His goodness? That God, ha- God is greater, God has more goodness, God is so good, eternity is not long enough to experience all of it. Let your mind just kind of go, forever will not tap the excessiveness of of God's goodness. Where does that goodness get expressed? In Christ. What is God doing here when he makes us alive in Christ Jesus? That, that who experiences. So think about this. God is opening to us the same glorious relationship that he has with Jesus. The delight, the pleasure, the glory that they share in their infinite love for each other that never grows old, never gets stale, is always fresh. God's cracking open the Trinity and welcoming us into their experience and saying, let me love you like I love my son. Let me pour the excessive love and adoration I have for Jesus Let me pour that on you. All the acceptance I have for my son, all the favor I have for my son, all the pleasure I have for my son, let me lavish that love on you. So what's our contrast? How big is this contrast? Am I the only one that's kind of got my mind blown? <laughs> right? it's, it's epic, right? This contrast is incredible. Okay? Give me seven words that describe the second half of the contrast at your tables. Seven words. <laughs>
All right, you got something? You need another minute? Are you good? All right, you guys ready? All right, let's do it in reverse order. All right, Paul, you guys are up. I like that. I like that. Very good. Nice and tight. Well done. Say it again, nice and loud. Read it one more time, Paul. <laughs> All right. I like it. All right. I like that too. That's good. I like that. I like the as if Jesus part. All right. Jane, you the spokeswoman? I like that. We're going for a little bit of a G alliteration there. That was good. I like that. <laughs> All right. You see how good you guys are getting at this? Right? Just got to get the brains working, and now you're summarizing massive concepts. All right, David. Let's Good, solid. I like it. I like it. Um, Anna? Ooh, I like that too. Some good words in there. Awesome. All right, I didn't get a, an all alliteration this time. I just put uh, livingly, living lavishly love forever in God's favor. Um, so similar concepts. Uh, so put it all together. What's the contrast? <laughs> yeah, do you see how, how massive this contrast is, right? That you were as dead as dead could possibly be, under wrath, driven by this satanic culture, living in disobedience. Now, God in his infinite grace and favors made you alive, seated you with Christ so he could for eternity love you in an inconceivable uh, infinite fashion. That's the contrast. That's who you are. Okay? That makes sense? All right. So that's, we're out of time. Sorry. Uh, but we did some good work today. Give yourselves a round of applause. Good job. All right. So the homework for next week is go ahead and do your observations for the remaining three. We'll finish off this paragraph and get into the next one. Uh, it's a shorter one, so we'll be able to finish this one off and do the next paragraph as well. So um, if you don't have question and answer charts, grab some and, uh, or grab one, make a copy. Uh, but ask, try to ask some factual questions and some implication questions. And we'll spend a little more time next week looking at the, the question asking process. Any questions? A qualifier uh, limits and modifier expands. Okay. All right. David, you want to pray for us? Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for being here, guys. God bless you.